And we welcome back to the show our good friend, the one and only reasonable Ohio State fan, Mark Rogers, the voice of college football, who himself has a fantastic YouTube channel year-round, uh, talking all things college football. Good to see you, my friend. How are you? Steve, good to see you as well. Uh, we are buried in snow, but I'm doing well and just waiting for pitchers and catchers and better weather and all of that. Yeah, we are. we have testicle-crushing temperatures right now. In the state of Iowa, brother. I mean, it it will it will ruin your soul. Uh, and my understanding is, in places like Ohio, in the Northeast, where you're at, three feet of snow in some of those places that nor'easter is is that right? Did I read that right? Yeah. So the uh, bone chilling temperatures, maybe not at the level that you're experiencing, but just the steady snow since Super Bowl Sunday, it has not stopped snowing. Wow. Wow. So then you're even worse off than us, and that means that I don't. I shouldn't complain, but I probably will anyway. So, Mark, let's get to it. Uh, with the, with both signing days now here and gone, we know which players declared for the NFL draft, which are coming back. We still have those super seniors, you know, taking advantage of the uh, extra COVID year, still making their decisions. But I laid out at the top of the show the initial team total talent ratings for 2021 uh, and compared Michigan's against the rest of its Power 5 schedule. I remain dubious that the Washington game is going to be played, but we'll see. But I have this, and again, I, I don't make these assessments. I'm just looking at recruiting rankings and applying them to the current roster. Then I've got Michigan with the sixth most talented roster in the country right now. Now there's going to be further attrition with spring football, things of that nature. I think they were the 10th most talented roster, or 11th last year, and went two and four. But when you look at those team total talent ratings, clearly Ohio State, your school, the class of the Big Ten, and there's a there's a there's definitely a a, a chasm between them and Michigan. But in my rankings, there's a chasm between Michigan and the rest of the Big Ten as well. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I commend you for your rating system. And I got to think that it's become a little bit more difficult here in the last two years with this transfer portal in particular, and mm -hmm. then also COVID bringing back the sixth year seniors. Uh, so you've got a lot more tracking to do these days and going forward with the transfer portal, which is involved. I don't even know what the count is at this point. So what comes to mind is uh, if you just run the, the sheer numbers of your team totals, Michigan is supposed to be an 11 and one football team this year. Uh, you know, of course, uh, arriving at the big house against Ohio State undefeated. Of course, Indiana's uh, lowly rated Northwestern. It, it pretty much plays out the way you would anticipate. Those teams that are developing players that we all know about, Wisconsin, Northwestern at the front of the line, are doing just that. And, and those teams that are not your team in particular, Nebraska's right there as well, that are underachieving are there. Maryland's a, a, an anomaly. They're kind of an aberration. We'll see what they're able to do with uh, their newfound talent in recent recruiting classes under Mike Loxley. I was not for that hire, but maybe he's going to do a decent job there. We shall see. What I did was I kind of took the talent through the process of where it needs to go uh, through the system to produce the results that to would develop it. Yeah. Recruiting. Yeah. The development. That's so what this is. This is a measurement of raw material. This is not a measurement of how good of a team you will have this fall. This is a measurement of how good is the raw material that your st coaching staff begins with to mold that into an actual team, right? That's that's what this is a measurement of. If if Bill Connolly at, at now ESPN, if he's measuring how good your team is, like he came out with his SB plus ratings for next year or next season today, his first ones. He's measuring how good he thinks your team will finish based on the known quantities of returning production primarily and then also recruiting. I wanted to measure how good your team could be. The guys that we don't know about yet. Not the not the freshmen that just signed, but the guys that redshirted or um, the third string tailback who was a hot shot recruit two years ago, but we forgot about him while he was a backup and now it's his turn, right? That's what I wanted to measure is how good your team then could be. And that's what this is. This is, a, this is merely a measurement of the raw material, not how good your team actually is. So basically, I could give you my rough evaluation of looking at the Michigan program from the outside, but I'm also going to turn this on you, Steve, to have you give basic grades on these phases of the development of any program as it pertains to any individual player. First of all, you just recruit the sheer talent, and you've already measured that. Michigan's sixth in the country in 
recruiting just sheer talent. And then you've um, certainly put in some guidelines in terms of assessing that talent development uh, if it's uh, overachieved or underachieved, or certainly if it's overachieved, as uh, your Tanner Morgan uh, example comes to light. But also, then that player arrives on campus, campus, and there's a there's a culture, there's an organization, there's a structure, there's an environment, there's accountability that's given to that player to improve and do all the right things, or there's a lack of all of that. Mm-hmm. So where does Michigan stand in regards to that player arrives on ta- uh, on campus as a very talented player? What is he given the structure, the environment that he needs to succeed? No. See, this is my yeah. argument with Ari Wasserman that that he continues every now and then on his Twitter feed. I'm not arguing that Ohio State out recruits Michigan. I'm arguing that actually Ohio State has always out recruited Michigan. I mean, I went back and looked at NFL draft list from the 70s, recruiting rankings in the 80s. Ohio State's always out recruited Michigan. See, I, I think maybe he's actually higher on the program than I am because he's looking at what Michigan needs to do to beat Ohio State. We're not even we're not even living up to the recruiting talent we have to be the clearly second best team. Yeah, that's my issue. Like we're talking about beating Ohio State. Do we went three and three against Michigan State in the doldrums of the final of D'Antonio's uh, twilight and Mel Tucker's debut? We've got a losing record against James Franklin. We have been freaking housed two years in a row by Wisconsin, and frankly, three out of the last four meetings. So. Um, I I mean, I'm not right now. I'd love to beat Ohio State. I'm tired of losing to them. I would just like my team to actually play up to its own raw material first, because I think if we were to do that, we have a better chance of getting the next three to four level three to four next level recruits we need to start beating you guys. Because right now we're not even beating the teams we're supposed to be beating with the level of talent that we have. So we're so we're doing very poor. That's why they completely. That's why you just saw Jim Harbaugh go Brian Kelly to 2016 on his coaching staff. That that's an acknowledgement of that. So so this is these are the other mile markers in which Michigan's underachieving to be able to get the results that should be matching the recruiting rankings. Okay, so I pointed out basically we'll just put one word on it: culture, your organization, your structure, everything that goes into uh, that player's at least their surroundings. Okay. Then number two, then you've got development. Development of the player as a football player. You know, how they practice on the field, the weight room, the training, the strength and conditioning, the film room study, all of that, developing them just merely as a football player. Then the next thing you have is you've got I think we do all right there when you look at the amount of guys that we put into the NFL. Because I think what happens is we skip the second step there. Like there is no Michigan football culture. What is the Michigan football culture? If I were to ask you, your answer would be Jim Harbaugh. That's a brand. That's not a Michigan football culture. You know, Bo Schimbeckler was a powerful brand, but you knew what his football culture was. Jim Harbaugh doesn't have a culture. There's a brand. And the brand is Jim Harbaugh, and you come here and get to the NFL. So we, we do great with the first step, skip the second one, and then do pretty good with the, with the third one. That's why you put all these guys in the NFL and have nothing significant as a program to show for it during this era. So my next step in this, Steve, would be Offensive system, defensive system. How much does it make sense? How sophisticated is it? How does it compare to your competition? How do you prepare those players to to be able to fit into that system? Are you recruiting the right players to fit the system in addition to just recruiting and, and who signing? Knows? I mean, we're talent. on our he's been, he's been the coach here for seven years or, or six years. We're about to go into our third completely different defense since he's been here. We're on our second completely different offense since he's been here. We have a defensive coordinator that's never coordinated before and an offensive coordinator that hasn't proven in two years that he can actually coordinate. So that again, again be, yes, those are great points. And you're you're quantifying my laments very well. Thank you. So so let me throw this let me throw this stat at go ahead. You want to finish? Go ahead. Yeah. Let me let me finish my process because this brings us to game day. How well have you prepared your team, your your game planning Mm -hmm. for the game versus your opponent, and then the adjustment at halftime and throughout the game to deal with what you're being presented by the opponent? I think he was terrific at that the first few years, and that's fallen off the last couple of years. And so really, when you go through your five steps, uh, steps one and three, I think Michigan gets an A. Step B, uh, step two is an F. Step four is uh, who the hell knows. 
And step five was an A, if you would have asked me this 2016, 2017, or even 2018. Now I would tell you it's at, it's a C because it's trending down from there. Do you think those are fair assessments? Uh, I think from the outside, yeah, I would agree with that. And uh, yeah, Jim Harbaugh is a personality. He's a brand. Exactly. So let's go to this stat. And I forgot to give credit now because I ran out of space. This is from Athlon Sports. Want to make sure they get credit for this. 26 of the 28 Michigan State and Washington are the two exceptions. 26 of the 28 teams to so far make the college football playoff mark, averaged top 15 recruiting classes the four years leading up to the season. Heading into 2021, that's these 14 teams, and and they're listed in the order of their average recruiting rank in the last four years. Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, Clemson, LSU, Oregon, Texas, Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Florida, Notre Dame, Michigan, just behind Notre Dame, Penn State, just behind Michigan, and Auburn, who has had so much attrition, they won't count on this list with the coaching change. Miami had finished with an average of 15.75. So Miami just missed the cut. So what does it mean? Based on the the trend line, 93% chance the four teams playing for the college football national title here next December are going to be the for the teams on that list. And, and then we've got about three basic components that either elevate a team into that category. I don't think it's going to elevate anybody outside that category all the way to the top of that list where they're actually playing in the playoff. But like I would take a Wisconsin is saying that they're outperforming a number of those teams on the field because their system is just so good, but it can't make up for the talent gap to lift them into the playoff. It has yet to do that. And they really haven't been a serious contender albeit one year at 2017 with a weak schedule where they had one loss and played in the Big Ten championship game. So they would be an outlier that kind of plays their way into that category. But again, to play your way into the top 14 to 16 versus making it to the, the playoff is a, the light years away. And Stanford was in that category as well. Um, I, I think uh, coaching, so, so that's kind of the system. The system that's able to elevate the program from a top 30 to 35 talent program into the top 10 to 15 range. Uh, the coach obviously has a lot to do with it, and I think that has more to do with the the decline of some of the teams or the underachievement of many of the teams, albeit, you know, Texas in particular uh, stands out to me uh, among the list that we've seen right there. We'll see what, see what uh, Sarkeesian has to say about that. But in addition, uh, but between Mac Brown and Sarkeesian, obviously Charlie Strong being case example number one of uh, a coach that just couldn't handle the job. Uh, so recruiting top five talent didn't matter. And then the quarterback, because the elite is maybe Alabama by itself or it's Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State by themselves, where Clemson was out recruited by those two for sure. And then also Georgia for much of that time. And they were more in that seven to nine range in recruiting, but generational quarterbacks like Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence lifted them Mm -hmm. to a top three position and probably go back to your team ratings where this could be an adjustment that would be somewhat controversial, but to value the quarterback in in the recruiting rankings more so than the other players. I don't don't know what value to put on it, but obviously the quarterback is the most important player. Yeah. That's that's a good point. And really quick on those two teams that didn't finish with top 15 recruiting classes for a four-year average, I mentioned Michigan State and Washington. Well, they were 2015 and 2016 with prolific record-setting senior quarterbacks returning, which means it's been four years since anybody who didn't average a top 15 recruiting class for four seasons has made the college football playoff. So, I mean, we're, we're trending further and further into how much more important those recruiting rankings are, are being. Washington, Washington was 2016, and Sparty was back in 2015. So, great stuff. And, and all, go ahead, Mark. Get the last word. Go ahead. A little bit of smoke and mirrors involved in both of those yeah. uh, situations for those teams as well. That Michigan State team lost to a five-win Nebraska team. They needed a miracle <laughs> yes. against your point to the big house, like yep. a complete like punter, just fall on the ball, don't flip it up in the air. And, of course, they had that aberration of a game, albeit give them all credit in Columbus and winning against Ohio State. That Washington team played one of the worst schedules you will ever see a right. Power 5 team Well, play. that's why, remember, but, going into the final week of the playoff rankings, we were sitting with two losses after losing to you guys. We were still ahead of them. 
And it was only after they beat Colorado for the Big 12 championship that the committee, because they had a, or, pa- or Pac-12, because they had a Power 5 uh, championship, moved them ahead of us. Remember that. So, yeah, but, yeah. Washington, that Washington team lost to USC by two scores, and yep. that USC team was really the best team in the Pac-12. Yep, you're right. Good stuff as always, man. We'll do it again. All right, take care. Good Always appreciate it.